Hello, everyone. This is week two for the Intro to Neurotechnology Crash Course. Um, we're going to be looking at neuroanatomy at the micro level this week, which will consist of, you know, basic anatomy of the neuron, um, how an action potential works, and also we'll look at neurochemistry a little bit, which is basically um, how various neurotransmitters interact with our um, nervous system. So quite just building off of what Kashal was doing last week um, at the larger scope of uh, the nervous system. So yeah, let's just get right into it. So our nervous system is organized um, quite differently. Um, I think the main two distinction, the main distinction actually, is just between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system just consists of our brain and our spine. Um, this is where all of the sensations or stimuli, um, all the signals received from stimuli, external stimuli from our um, olfactory receptors for smell at least, um, various other receptors for touch, so our, our tissue receptors, et cetera. So um, all this is organized then into the peripheral system, peripheral nervous system, which then uh, transfers it to the uh, central nervous system, excuse me, um, so that this um, sort of um, energy, so to speak, will be translated to higher level thinking and it can be applied to the rest of the body. So in general, in the nervous system, a huge pattern is how neurons are si si simply in, pat in uh, cyclical patterns. Um, I think that's a good way to put it. I mean, I feel that this image is really, really um, detailed and feel free to read it if you'd like. But I think maybe just taking a glance at it, a little um, skim would be perfectly fine. Um, but I think really, you know, the distinction between central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system would be great. So out, well, let, let me explain what the peripheral nervous system is. So the peripheral nervous system is everything else, essentially. Um, that can make up the receptors. That can also make up the parasympathetic and the uh, sympathetic. Yes, sympathetic um, nervous systems, which um, both regulate um, our fight or flight response or our uh, rest and digest. So how we digest food. Um, but all the details of that are on the slide. Uh, I'm not really going to just, you know, reiterate what's already written on the slide. Um, but uh, I think just having the idea is what's important here. So now we're just going to get na into more detailed um, description of what the neuron actually consists of. So the neuron in general um, are just the types of cells that make up the human nervous system or any nervous system for that matter. Um, they process and transmit electrical impulses throughout the nervous system. And a huge detail, a, hu a hugely important detail of neurons in that they can be excitatory or inhibitory. So when I first started learning about uh, neurons in general, I automatically thought all were excitatory um, just because of the very nature of you think of signals transmitted. You think, okay, well, if it goes, the chain reaction goes along. But in reality, a lot of neural circuits actually have the intention to inhibit some sort of neurotransmitter being released, um, inhibit some sort of neural activity in one specific part of the brain, et cetera. So um, the mere, the sort of activation, it doesn't necessarily inherently tell us if it's excitatory or inhibitory. So when you hear activation, when I, in the following slides, um, that's just saying that activation can either um, activate an excitatory behavior or inhibitory behavior. Excitatory meaning it fires or it keeps going, or inhibitory, it slows down or stops. Just to make that quick distinction. Uh, all right, so now we're gonna get into the, the various structures and parts of uh, the neuron, and we're even gonna get into some you know basic cell organelles that are pertinent to how the neuron works. So first of all, we have the cell body, which is dictated here. I mean, excuse me, depicted here. Um, and this basically just is the neurons like life support center. It's the center. Um, it contains the nucleus, so it also synthesizes the proteins to make the organelles. Um, but yeah, so it's basically you know the central hub of the neuron, if you will. Um, next, uh, we have the axon, which is basically the 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 strand in between the cell body and the axon terminal. Uh, this carries the uh, electrical impulse across. Um, Basically, that's its main um, body. I mean, its main function. 
Then we also have the dendrites, which receive uh, the signals from uh, previous neurons. Um, so they all kind of, as it were, as I assume we all are aware that neurons kind of uh, work in networks. So it's not just one neuron or a, a series of neurons in like a linear fashion. It's it's billions and billions of neurons just working all together all at once. So and they're all intertwined. So the reason why that's even possible is the fact that there's dendrites and axon terminals for every given neuron. So there's like many, many different combinations. Um, and this allows for many, many different uh, thoughts or behaviors or emotions. Um, next, we have the myelin sheath um, made up of proteins and fatty acids. And this just accelerates um, the electrical impulse across the exons. So this one, this one makes, this is what helps uh, it travel around very quickly. So our neurons fire very, very fast. Um, I do not know the exact uh, speed, but I assume it's near the speed of light because it's, it's almost instantaneous. I mean, we don't even think about it. Uh, we can't even comprehend it. So the myelin sheath uh, is very important in that. And when you hear the term, oh, this neuron is myelinated, uh, or et cetera, et cetera, this nerve is my myelinated, et cetera. Um, that just means it moves very fast. The, the signal moves very fast. Uh, it accelerates it. So, yeah. And then the nodes around the air are also kind of tied in that. Those are these little uh, gaps in between uh, the myelin sheath um, covering the axon. And these little gaps essentially allow the ions, which we'll talk about in later slides, to diffuse in and out of the neuron membrane. Um, so the signal travels along the axon. Um, but it needs some sort of energy for it to tr travel along. And then that uh, energy exchange occurs at the um, nodes of Bravier. So, yeah. And then the axon terminal is kind of, you know, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's where the signal leaves. So it's the end of the axon. Um, and that's where essentially the synapse occurs, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So, yeah, moving on. Um, continuing with um, some a little bit more specific organelles, so we have the axon hillock, which is just essentially when the um, the beginning of the axon um, inversely related to the axon terminal. Uh, so it's about approximately right here, as depicted. And then we also have the Golgi apparatus, um, which sorts and processes all the proteins and the prepares the vesicles um, that release the neurotransmitters um, at the synapse, which we'll talk about. Um, but yeah, so all of these sort of basic cell um, cell organelles that we've learned in you know our various biology classes from middle school and on, um, they still are present in neurons and they have relatively the same function, but maybe slight specific like specifics um, as in the Golgi apparatus. They create vesicles, but in this case, for neurotransmitters. Um, Oh, that is a spelling error that I will fix when I post the slides. Um, so the mitochondria, as you guys all know, is very, very important for cell respiration. And in this case, uh, the production of ATP, which is used by those ions I referred to um, that power the axon in the nodes of Rambier. So we use ATP for like this thing that we'll talk about called the sodium potassium pump, um, which allows all this basically to occur. So the mitochondria is very important. Uh, also, there's the endoplasmic reticulum. So there's rough ER, smooth ER. Um, but in this case, I kind of just kept the general. Uh, this produces the proteins. And this, you know, without that, there couldn't be any sort of um, process, I guess. And there wouldn't be any, um, you know, neurotransmitters produced, um, et cetera. So very important. Uh, then there's the nucleus, which we all know, uh, stores the cells genetic code and basically also acts in conjunction with the cell body as like its life's support center. All right, so then we have glial cells, which are pretty important as well. They're just like supportive cells in the nervous system, but they don't really have any sort of um, direct function or direct role in the transmission of the electrical impulse across the axon. They just usually provide assistance, kind of like the myelin sheath. It doesn't actually transmit any electrical signal, but it just helps it. Um, two of the ones that, um, so there, there's the Schwann cells, which was, um, which were uh, previously um, shown on the first slide of the neuro, um, of the neuron um, and its parts. And this is mainly 
They're responsible main, mainly apparent in the peripheral neurons in the peripheral in the peripheral nervous system that I previously mentioned. So, those are all your neurons that are associated with um, like movement and sort of motor functions. Um, and yeah, so that's that. And then there's also astrocytes, which I actually really find super super interesting. There's a lot of research going on about astrocytes and their various roles, but out, as outlined here, um, I think it's interesting that they kind of do all of the above. They regulate ion, nutrition, and the dissolved gas concentrations in the neuron. Um, they provide obviously structural support, um, but they, they, more importantly, I think, absorb and recycle the neurotransmitters um, emitted the, in the synapse, which we'll talk about um, what SSRIs are. Um, so reuptakes, these um, types of cells are really, very essential to that process. So very important um, so types of cells. All right, now the synapse, which is very important and um, essentially how neurons communicate. Um, there is the synaptic cleft as shown here, which is a gap between the neuro uh, or the axon terminal and the presynaptic neuron as, um, you know, intuitively um, named. And then there's also the dendrite, which is what we previously mentioned, which is the input in the postsynaptic neuron. Um, so this image right here kind of shows how these vesicles are packaged by the Golgi apparatus, containing these neurotransmitters, uh, which are, oops, excuse me, um, which are essentially peptides um, produced by the ER. And then, you know, transcripted, transcribed, uh, et cetera, um, by the cell. And these are packaged up. And then what essentially allows for all this movement to occur um, is because the voltage in the uh, calcium channels, calcium ion channels, um, activates these vesicles to be released by exocytosis. So the main, main sort of, um, um, I guess, part or, the main sort of um, role, uh, I'm trying to think of a better word, uh, I guess the main player, I guess that's the best way to say it right now, the main, most important player in this whole process is the calcium ion channel because without the calcium ion channel, the vesicles couldn't be released and then therefore the neurotransmitters couldn't be released and then the chemical message could not carry on. Um, so the, the chemical message is what essentially allows the electrical impulse to even travel. So a uh, given a neurotransmitter, which we'll talk about later, um, emits a sort of behavior for the neuron. So like usually neurotransmitters carry the distinction between excitatory or inhibitory. Um, and those neurotransmitters are merely just chemicals that are, recept that are received, excuse me, by using receptors in the postsynaptic post neuron. Um, if there's any questions about that, it's it's pretty essential um, concept. But if I might have um, rambled on quite a bit, um, just please let me know. I'm more than happy to email or um, give it external resources if you're really interested in this. Um, and then kind of building off of that, this is how, like I said, how neurons communicate, um, as kind of shown in this nice image right here. Um, and this is how neural networks are even possible because of this inherent behavior. Um, uh, oh yes, so this whole process just allows um, the uh, how ions can have a huge role in this whole process is that if it increases the charge enough, it can tr trigger an action potential, which is what we're getting to next. So these ion, this exchange of electrons, which is basically what all this is and allows for this whole process, which is just an exchange of energy, um, this can cause the next um, action potential to go along the, or the action potential or electrical impulse, whatever you'd like to call it, to go along to the next neuron. So this is what, how neurons communicate. This is how it all works. So as kind of shown here, so let's say here there's, this is the synapse right here at the, at another uh, presynaptic neuron, um, they had some sort of communication, some chemical messengers go through. And then these ions that, or chemicals which turn into ions that uh, exchange electrons, this allows 
the whole energy um, exchange to occur as these uh, as this electrical impulse travels down the axon. Um, as you can see here, at the end of the day, it's just some chemicals that are exchanged, which help carry on the electrical um, signal. It's not that electrical signal is just going by itself. The chemicals are very very important in this whole process. So yeah, and that these are also mostly positively charged, meaning that they're getting oxidized and losing electrons, which kind of makes sense, right? So if you're losing electrons, the energy is going to be passed down um, as such. All right, now we're getting to action potentials, which is basically the whole point and the whole purpose of how this can really apply to neurotechnology um, as certain as in an EEG, you're kind of reading um, how action potentials are going off in a given uh, set of neurons. So a basic model of this um, notion is depicted right here, but I think a really important principle to understand is the all or nothing principle, um, meaning that an action potential either fires completely or doesn't at all. Um, there's no in between, there's no intermediate, um, et cetera. I think a great analogy that I learned um, in high school when learning about this model was how in a toilet flushing, uh, it either flushes fully or it doesn't. And then it also kind of has this sort of threshold where if you pull, if you don't press the lever hard enough, um, it doesn't fire or it doesn't flush at all. You need to press that lever. And if you press that lever hard enough, it will fire no matter what, or not fire, excuse me, it will flush no matter what. And there's this sort of um, oscillating sort of function also depicted in the toilet flushing as it flushes and then it kind of re-equilibrates um, just as depicted here. So um, the resting state uh, voltage in uh, millivolts is negative 70 millivolts. Um, that's constant for any given neuron. And then the threshold is also negative 55 in order um, for the action, action potential to carry across the axon. And then the first process is known as depolarization, the repolarization. Um, there's this maxima at approximately 40 millivolts. And then the refractory period is also known as hyperpolarization. And then it goes back to resting. So essentially what allows all this to occur is the exchange of ions, um, spe more specifically sodium and potassium. Uh, it's not depicted here, but it will be on the next slide. Um, but yeah, so essentially what happens here is just the exchange of ions through the axon membrane, um, which allows for the increase in potential energy uh, and then the decrease, and then back to resting state. So I'll get into more detail on that in the next slide. So this is all possible, like I said, by the membrane potential. Um, and so basically as it's depolarizing in the, so if we assume that it passes the threshold, right, um, then it's gonna fire. And this all happens because sodium ion channels open in the membrane. Um, we'll see a better picture of that next, I believe. but. If you can imagine in the membrane, sodium channels open, which allow the large amount of concentration of sodium uh, ions outside of the cell to rush into the cell. Um, this gives a largely positive um, overall um, uh, mil um, voltage, I guess, overall positive voltage because the uh, resting um, the resting sodium uh, potential the yeah the resting sodium uh, potential in voltage in millivolts is around 65 uh, millivolts so that's a you know highly positive compared to negative 70 um, so that's going to really um, change the course of the uh, action potential it allows it to go um, and move and um, yeah essentially but then eventually the sodium channels close if there's too much of uh, too many sodium ions in the in the cell, so then the potassium channels open, which then lead to a large uh, amount of uh, potassium ions, which have a um, resting, a largely negative resting um, potential energy to rush out of the cell. So it's essentially what essentially happens in 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 short is that in the beginning in depolarization there's a large concentration of um, sodium ions rushing into the cell and a small um, concentration of potassium flowing out. And then the, 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 it's essentially inversed um, in repolarization. And then in hyperpolarization, this allows, this is just re-equilibrating back 
um, after this, the sodium potassium, oh, the potassium channels close eventually, right? So then it would become less negative. Um, I could have depicted it more mathematically, and if you'd like that, I could uh, send you um, an article that I, I read before I kind of came up with this slide. Uh, but I think what's most important is that, once again, it is an oscillating sort of function that requires some or gets an increase in potential energy in, uh, in voltage, and then essentially re-equilibrates back to the resting after it's fired or after it's tra traveled across the axon if that makes sense. So uh, like I said, this is kind of how this is all possible. Um, the gradient in a neuron is both uh, electrical and chemical, which is quite unique because then it can move across um, its membrane um, or against, against the gradient, not only for, it, can, it doesn't have to only diffuse, which is from high to low concentration. It can go from low to high, um, which is what it does. Uh, as shown here, um, this is basic diffusion, and this is just when it's strictly electrical, it'll just go to the opposite charge. But in this case, there's a large concentration of, uh, there's a large concentration of like, let's say sodium ions, but then the, the charge um, on the opposite side. So how do I explain this better? Um, so since there's a large amount of sodium uh, on the outside of the cell, it's going to want to diffuse naturally and spontaneously. Um, however, there is a large, also a large amount of uh, potassium ions in the, in the inside of the membrane, sorry, not the cell, the membrane. And so this kind of allows these ions to flow um, accordingly because of the opposite signs. At the same time though, the rate is what is kind of implicated, meaning that it's not that it's so either or, it's not that only um, potassium are flowing out or only sodium are flowing in, it's that in uh, depolarization, more sodium are flowing in than calcium, I mean not calcium, potassium flowing out, if that makes sense. And that allows for the whole thing to occur um, and allows for the equilibrated sort of mechanism if that makes sense. So by having those opposite charge, so it's largely negative outside of the cell um, because of the potassium flowing out um, and for the same reason the sodium flowing in. But it's not always like that. It, it depends on the amount of concentration at a given moment in the action potential graph. Um, I hope that was as concise as I could have made it to be, but let's see. Ah, okay, so this is kind of a more direct application to neurotechnology. So uh, as you can see, kind of what I was just saying, so outside of the cell, there's a large positive um, charge because of the you know, in, um, large amount of sodium ions that have positive around 65 millivolts. And then on the inside, it's, um, I believe it's negative 84 millivolts of potassium. So once again, and then the resting membrane potential is negative 70. So when a large amount of sodium rush in, that's gonna increase the millivoltage from negative 70 to whatever it was, 40, around there. And then eventually, once it reaches its maxima, it's gonna uh, uh, repolarize by having the potassium move in. So this is all possible because there's an opposite magnitude of potential energy on, even, on each given side of the membrane. And then that allows the sort of um, electrical signal to travel across the terminal, the axon to the terminal um, pretty you know, readily. Just, just as depicted here, um, kind of like what I was saying before, so there would be like nodes of Ranvier here, and then it would be my, all myelinated. So the nodes of Ranvier are, that's the point in which the sodium ions move in or the potassium moves out. Um, and that, it, in the next um, slide, there will be an image really depicting that really clearly as such. So yes, this is it. Um, so this is kind of a nice little image here depicting how um, as positive flows out, the, the charge in general is, you know, all positive. It's a positive charge. So this allows the um, uh, negative charge to flow out, um, you know, for a little bit, and then the positive charge to flow in. Um, is that correct? Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. So yes, 
So yes, so as you can see previously, before the uh, signal even reaches the um, sort of uh, the ion exchange, because in this case, it's only one ion, um, which is not correct. It's like I said, large concentrations and small concentrations, but for the sake of the example, um, before it even reaches, there's a positive and then a negative, positive on the outside, negative on the inside. And then this positive charge essentially um, allows that whole process to be um, cyclical. Once again, a huge pattern uh, in the whole um, process of how neurons communicate. Um, so the positive charge has the, is, uh, reacts with the negative charge, which pushes it outside, which then in turn uh, moves the positive ion to the inside, which is, um, opposes the positive charge traveling across which is what the action potential is positive, it's positively charged. Um, so that's what allows it to move, kind of just a big deer. Um, I hope that was concise. Um, there are a lot of videos and resources on the internet um, if that wasn't as concise as you'd like it to be. But I think that uh, the action potential is really crucial in how we can approach in building BCIs and solving certain problems. Um, so yeah, we're gonna move on now to, I believe, neurochemistry. Oh, excuse me, before we do that, we're gonna kind of look at more in depth uh, the channels and the, the mechanisms of how this occurs directly. So like I said, this is a nice little picture of the membrane. Um, so this is externally, internally. Um, there's also you know, some uh, um, chlorine ions as well, um, which interact with the potassium. But for the sake of example, we're just gonna focus on potassium and um, sodium. So like I said, there are those just the basic channels which allow it just to flow through quite easily, but there's also the sodium potassium pump, which is a, which is a um, pump that is, requires ATP. So ATP is hydrolyzed here, so it loses a phosphate, or it, yeah, it loses a phosphate, or loses an ion essentially, um, loses an electron essentially, which powers the sodium potassium pump. It's active transport. So three potassium, oh, three sodium ions are transferred for every two uh, potassium um, as such. So yeah, exactly. So as three um, sodium are uh, transferred um, into the cell or out of the cell, um, two potassium are transferred back in or vice versa. So it kind of works as like a acceptor and then a donator. And then, but it is active transport. So that's why the mitochondria, as previously mentioned, is very important in this case, as it allows for all this to occur. All right, so finally we have neurochemistry, um, which is basically, I'm just gonna give a nice little overview of all like the main neurotransmitters that we uh, experience and are, uh, you know, apparent in our nervous systems. Um, and maybe we can even apply this knowledge to how we build our BCIs in neurotech. So first and foremost, I kind of just wanted to give a nice little summary of what receptors are. I didn't really explicitly talk about them. I kind of just assumed, but just wanted to recap on that. Um, so um, neuroreceptors can also cause an excitatory or inhibitory potential, similarly to neurons in general. Um, they receive a signal. Um, there's a binding site. Uh, and then this gives off a certain reaction. And then they can also turn certain genes on or off or the expression of these genes on or off, which will in turn create more of a neurotransmitter or less of a neurotransmitter. And then there's actually two types of receptors, which, is, which are on the next slide. So there's uh, ion-tropic receptors, which uh, are kind of just like channels. Um, they receive a signal or a neurotransmitter and just travel it along. And then there's metabotropic, metabotropic, there you go, I believe that's the correct pronunciation. It receives the chemical messenger as such. And then that, uh, it's a little bit longer, more complex of process. It causes the activation of the G protein here, and then that releases a secondary messenger, and that's what uh, causes the uh, the communication to occur. So here's the phospholipid bilayer uh, membrane. So in this case, like I said, this the chemical messenger, the neurotransmitter, uh, we just travel along accordingly. These have to be usually ion specific or um, specific to a neurotransmitter. Well, in this case, they it receives a given uh, chemical, and then given that, it re uh, releases sort of other um, messengers to carry along that same message, so to speak. 
um, excitatory inhibitory um, as the more general distinction. Um, but yeah. Okay, so now we're a little overview on um, neurotransmitters. So they're just chemical messengers, like I said, they give, they're trying to give off a message of some sort and they can be inhibitory and excitatory once again. And then these, are, these chemicals are how we perceive our, what we can conceive as our emotions, our thoughts, or even like physical phenomena, kind of like they, they kind of regulate our heartbeat, um, our, um, what else, what else? Yeah, our heartbeat, like even like muscle stimulations um, can be caused by this, but yeah. So first and foremost, there's acetylcholine, a very widely distributed excitatory neurotransmitter, um, which is directly related to the voluntary muscle contraction and also stimulates ex uh, excretion of certain hormones. However, it's, while it is excitatory in the neuromuscular joints across the body, so the muscles in general, um, it's actually inhibitory in the heart, so it, this really helps uh, regulate the heart rate in the nerve. Um, yeah, essentially, regulates heart rate. Why am I saying more? <laughs> Um, and this is actually made from acetyl-CoA, which is, if you've taken this 2 a uh, product of glucose, um, as depicted here. Um, so this is a really more detailed uh, version of like the synapse, and this is just a very general synapse sort of uh, image. And then this is like really specific to acetylcholine, um, which is um, very interesting, but also not very, very um, you know, necessary to memorize or anything like that. Uh, just thought it would be nice to include. So now moving on, uh, dopamine. So dopamine is associated with movement, uh, attention, and learning. But most, most importantly, uh, it's really uh, important to how our, like it modulates our mood and also really plays a central role in our neural circuit of positive reinforcement and dependency. So very important in terms of uh, certain activities or certain stimuli that give us some sort of feeling of pleasure. Um, dopamine is not directly related to the feeling of pleasure per se, but merely the anticipation of it. Um, there's a lot of dopamine if you are anticipating a really, um, you know, pleasurable task or something of that sort. Um, this is why is dopamine levels are severely affected by uh, addiction. Um, so if you're addicted to you know, um, some sort of substance or task or something like that, um, this, that, that's what, um, the dopamine levels are directly affected because if you're um, doing that task over and over, uh, there's not going to be as much dopamine released if you're doing the same amount. So that's why people get addicted to things because they are merely chasing that dopamine high, that feeling of like that feeling of um, not euphoria, but more so that feeling of like, com like completion and contentness um, and yeah, so it, they're very highly, highly malleable. Um, and yeah, super important neurotransmitter. Next are endorphins, which are pretty much related to like the feeling of relief and release almost uh, to a certain extent of performing like a really extraneous task, or in this case, exercise. I usually think endorphins are associated with exercise. So if you, you know, work out, um, the reason why you feel really good after or you know you just went on a run or something like that. It's because there's a lot of endorphins pumping around, which also give off that feeling of like euphoria um, and yeah, and like not not necessarily pleasure, but all, almost like a feeling of accomplishment. I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, then there's serotonin, which also plays a really huge role in our mood, our sleep, our appetite, um, and also impulsive and aggressive behavior. Um, this is why also. Um, there's uh, been a large influx in the you know recent time before I mean not like a few years but like in the in the set, turn of the century of SSRI drugs um, which are essentially uh, known as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So like I mentioned uh, previously in of uh, the uh, astrocytes, how they help the reuptake of neurotransmitters. In this case, this specific drug um, blocks that reuptake. So when a neuron gives off a, a given neurotransmitter, in this case it would be serotonin, um, there's always some uh, you know, excess left over. Um, it's never a perfect you know, one-to-one -one ratio. And being that, um, by essentially blocking that reuptake, which is what those SSRI do, there's gonna be 
the excess is going to be even more absor uh, absorbed. Um, so the postsynaptic, postsynaptic neuron will absorb even more serotonin, which will increase your, you know, your good mood or whatever the case may be. It's really used to um, treat depression, I believe. Um, don't know that off the top. I'm just going off the top of my head there, but I uh, don't know for sure. Um, but yeah, I thought that was, you know, really important to include in this case. So now moving on, uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine uh, associated with like alertness and our attentiveness. Um, but mainly norepinephrine is really the neurotransmitter associated with our fight or flight response, um, which is just a basic human uh, response to any given stimuli that uh, seems life-threatening. Um, so all these symptoms or all these behaviors are kind of what happens. So this is one that's actually more directly related to our um, sort of physical phenomena instead of like our mood, so to speak, um, or our dependency on something like dopamine and serotonin. Those are more related to like our internal um, aspects and then norepinephrine and acetylcholine even are related more so to uh, physical. So yeah, rapid heartbeat, dilated pupil, I mean, pupils, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. Um, final two are GABA, which is gamma amino acid, butyric acid. Uh, don't really need to memorize that at all. I just, everyone calls it GABA. Um, this is a, a largely distributed uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter in the CNS. And it really uh, contributes to like motor control, regulation of a lot of different systems. Um, and a lack of this um, neurotransmitter actually can lead to too many signals and can cause um, conditions like epilepsy and just other various mood disorders or even seizures. So I like to think of it as just like a stop sign almost because it's really slowing everything down, keeping it nice and neat essentially um, and not too much chaos going around. So this is definitely one that's inhibitory. And then conversely, there is glutamate, which is the most prominent neurotransmitter in the brain. And it's actually responsible for all the excitatory activation in the nervous system. And um, yeah, like I said, it's kind of inverse to GABA in its behavior. And if it's in excess, it actually can cause seizures and even lead to like epilepsy as well. So that's why um, these kind of GABA and glutamate work hand in hand with each other. Um, and that's why I also included this sort of green light. I like to think of it as, you know, glutamate go, it's going large, large amounts of um, excitatory activation while GABA is like slow down. Um, both are essential though. Um, and yes. Okay. Um, oh, I did want to mention one more thing. So if GABA is in excess, actually, this can actually, um, is this, this actually leads to like a lot of, you know, lethargic sort of feelings. Um, I believe GABA is, um, more, is released more when consuming a depressant, uh, a drug, uh, you know, um, given drug that is classified as a depressant. Um, so that's why that feeling of like sluggishness or, you know, feeling very lethargic is associated with the large amounts of GABA. And I believe also if there's not a lot, a lot of glutamate firing, you can have that feeling as well, but I'm not too sure. I know the GABA for sure though. Um, so finally we have the types of neurons. Um, there are three main types. So there's the sensory, I mean, excuse me, the sensory, uh, also known as the afferent and the motor afferent and then the inner, um, kind of depicted here, kind of intuitive. Uh, sensory is the input, um, what takes up. So a lot of dendrites in those types of neurons. They take that up to the inner neurons, which are usually just, usually have two cell bodies and have a lot of, um, a lot of receptors. Uh, and then the motor neurons have a lot of outputs or axon terminals. So yeah, kind of, like I said, another cyclical process, um, but thought it would be nice to have this sort of image and also know the terminology afferent, efferent, because afferent um, and efferent are also used a lot in um, literature. Um, in the literature that we probably will be reading um, related to various um, devices in neuroscience. So in efferent, I kind of really like to remember like an effect, like cause and effect. So efferent is the effect or the output and then afferent is the opposite, so the input. Um, so almost done here. Some unknowns and some questions. Uh, the main thing is like, we still don't know, even though with the loads of research um, that we've been fortunate enough to, to conduct and also the new findings we've found in neuroscience. I'm saying we, like I've done any research, but uh, that I've seen, there's, we still don't know exactly 
uh, how information is stored in a neuron. I mean, we can also, we can measure all these various sort of uh, units or these um, sort of, you know, units we've made for like energy exchange, but we still don't know how information, which is basically the crux of what this, of what is very fascinating kind of almost terrifying of the, of the, of the brain. So we still don't really know how information is stored. We know maybe kind of where we can kind of guess where and how neurons communicate, but we still don't know how inherently information is stored. And we also don't know how biological neurons function can be mimicked uh, artificially. Uh, you know, we've heard of artificial neural networks and they've been, you know, conducted sort of mathematically, but we still can't, since there's just such a vast amount of, uh, biological neurons in our in our system like I believe it's a hundred billion um, which is quite a lot um, it's even it's very very hard to you know generate this artificially so they're trying to come up with ways um, in various labs across the world um, but yeah I think those were the two biggest unknowns that are still yet to be answered and finally the application to neurotech which I kind of have mentioned throughout the presentation um, I think this the the knowledge of neuroanatomy and how an action potential works, very, very important because we must know how our biological systems work in order to solve them from an engineering sort of um, approach. So we can, we should know how neurological problems such as neurological diseases, so they stem from a, either a large amount of a neurotransmitter or, you know, a, a small amount, which we, you know, covered. Uh, and then we can solve those problems using BCIs because then given certain um, certain activation or in, inhibitory uh, neural circuits, excuse me, um, certain neural circuits can be activated or inhibited by our device that we can um, design and hopefully build. And also, this can also optimize or augment our current abilities, kind of what Kashal had already previously mentioned. So we can be able to, you know, given the more release of an excitatory neurotransmitter, we can probably do a task a lot faster or remember things a lot faster, et cetera. Um, that was just a general example. I still don't know if even that's possible, but I think it's very, very important if a bio, if we, we have to know what we're working with before we work on it essentially. So yeah, that's why I thought this lecture was essential and I believe that is it. So thank you for turning, tuning in to this week's um, lecture. I uh, truly appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me uh, via email or uh, any other member of the board. Um, yeah, so I really hope you're staying safe and healthy throughout these, you know, unprecedented times. Um, but we truly appreciate your commitment if you're doing the modules um, this week. Um, so yeah, take care.